Hundreds of thousands of wildebeest. A million flamingos. And hundreds of millions of this tiny bird, the red-billed quelia. The Quelia story is fascinating and complex. No other bird has inspired such heated debate or created so much animosity among scientists and farmers. The Quelia sometimes destroy crops. Early records even attribute famine to this little seed eater. The debate still goes on. Drastic measures have been adopted to control its numbers. However, despite the destruction of hundreds of millions of birds, the quelia is as numerous today as it was when operations began 40 years ago. International agencies have joined forces with East African governments in efforts to resolve what has become known as the quelia problem. But the solution has proved extraordinarily difficult to find. The search for the solution begins with a study of individual birds trapped in nets erected near the roosts. At nightfall, all the quelia within a radius of 30 kilometers fly into roost at one place. And in a failing light, it's very difficult for the birds to see the nets. The roost may harbour a million birds, and the number caught in the nets represents but a small fraction of those that die from natural causes every night. Examination of a reasonable number of birds from a roost can tell the experts from which of the three known East African populations they have come. Each population has a characteristic mix of different black mask patterns. Cranium four. Sometimes a few birds with a white mask turn up. Undeveloped ovary. The average weight of a bird varies between 15 and 22 grams according to age, sex and the season. Underweight birds. Quelia must return to their roosts at night with enough food in their crops to sustain them until the following morning, or else they may die. The contents of this crop reveal exactly what the birds are feeding on. Is it their natural food, grass seeds, or are they raiding crops? A flock of one million birds consumes about five tons of seed every day. Molting flight feathers indicate that this flock cannot fly far and must be feeding nearby. The Quelia story begins with the onset of the rains, when the seeds that the birds have been feeding on germinate. The sudden drop in food supply forces them to move on. Before leaving, the birds gorge themselves on termites, also brought out by the heavy rains, which give them the extra strength they'll need for a flight of up to 600 kilometers. They fly to where the rains have fallen some short time before, where the grasses have already produced their seed, providing the quelia with an abundance of food. In this lush grassland, the social activity of the birds increases. The molt into breeding plumage begins. Soon the red bill of the female will turn yellow and the male's black mask will appear. A short distance away, other developments are taking place. 
another species of weaver suddenly flies in and begins to nest. The chestnut weaver is a larger bird, but less numerous. The area it chooses for nesting is often equally attractive to the quelia. The presence of nesting chestnut weavers is generally a good indication that the quelia are not far behind. Small flocks of male quelia appear, flying low and fast. They give no hint of the magnitude of the activity to come. The males are alone, but their song and their plumage show quite clearly that they are ready to breed. The first knot, a thin blade of grass tied firmly around an acacia branch is the beginning of one nest and the beginning of a quelia breeding colony. Spontaneously the small flocks congregate and begin collecting grass. The excitement is infectious. Soon all the males are caught up in the fever of nest building. Within an hour a million nests are under construction. Every bush is alive with birds over an area of 20 hectares. The noise and excited activity draws in flocks of females whose yellow bills show that they too are ready to breed. Every male now displays and tries to attract a female to his nest. The more vigorous the display, the more chance a male has of acquiring a mate. It's during this stage that mating takes place. As well as displaying, weaving and collecting grass, the males must also find time to feed themselves. Masked weavers, like the chestnut weavers, are also commonly associated with quelia colonies. These two are further ahead with their nest building. Within two hours, the rings from which the nests will be suspended are complete. The nuptial dance continues. Some males are still trying to attract a female. A second wave of chestnut weavers arrives. This colony is going to be exceptionally large. All the quelia are paired off now. The males stop displaying and throw all their energies into finishing the nests. The first chestnut weavers have completed their nests and have already laid their eggs. A concentration of so many birds collecting grass provides an occasional feast for dwarf mongooses. Stealing nest material is quicker than collecting it, sometimes. Within 12 hours of mating, the first eggs will be laid. Events move fast in a quelia breeding colony, and synchrony is vital. If the birds have mated too soon, or if the males started nest building too late, a million eggs would fall through the bottom of the incomplete nests. That would be the end of the colony, 
for unlike other birds, the quelia will not lay here again if the first egg is lost. While the male goes off to collect more grass, the female moulds the nest to shape. By the middle of the second day, the nest is well on the way to completion. The females are ready to lay. Each female is constantly at her nest, though she takes no part in the building. The final task is to complete the protective porch over the entrance. By the end of the second day, the nest is finished. The male's task is over. Now the females take possession, spending the night in the nest. After feeding and drinking at dawn on the third day, they lay the first egg. The green grass used in the nest soon dries out, and for the first time the full extent of the colony can be seen. The bulk of the colony is packed into the thick riverine scrub where the nests are almost touching. The rest spills out onto the plain, less dense but spread over a much wider area. By now the females have laid all three eggs. The males take their turn in the 10-day incubation, which began as soon as the first egg was laid. There's one of the white-masked quelia. In the heat of the day, the incubating birds may leave the eggs. When the temperature falls, the birds resume incubation. The birds change over after feeding. Unlike most weaver birds, the quelia do not line their nest. Perhaps ventilation keeps the temperature down during the hottest part of the day. As incubation proceeds, there are developments around the colony which are vital to its success. A vast army of insects has hatched in the fresh grass. These will be the first food of the newly hatched quelia chicks, which cannot digest grass seed for the first three days of their lives. Again, synchrony is vital. All the chicks would die if they hatched before the insects were available. In a million nests, the first chicks are hatching. The eggshells are removed by the females and dropped just under the nests. The chicks demand food from the moment they hatch. A million insects must be found immediately and at intervals throughout the day. Each one is mashed in the bill before feeding. Next day sees the arrival of the second chick. Just as the eggs were laid a day apart, so they will hatch a day apart. Now two million insects are needed for each feed. 
30 million for the day. Day three, insect demand is up to 45 million. Flight feathers have already appeared on the first chick by the time the last one hatches. The hatch is over and the colony moves into the next phase of its rapid development. Once again, synchrony is vital. The stock of insects around the colony has been heavily depleted, but fields of ripening grass seed are now available to feed the hungry multitude. New seed, soft enough to be digested by the tiny chicks. The adult birds may have to fly several kilometers to find grass seed at just the right stage of development. They fly out in small flocks, fill their crops with unripe seed and return to the nests. Both parents feed the young. The birds regurgitate the seed with some effort. The semi-liquid meal also provides all the water that the chicks need at this stage of their lives. By the fifth day, the chicks have the first feathers on their heads. Full for the moment, falling asleep, but always ready for another meal. Acacia thorn bush is not without hazard. But the quelia nest among the vicious thorns for a very good reason. So much activity concentrated in one place does not go unnoticed. Marabou storks have an uncanny ability to find nesting colonies in the vast expanse of the quelia's range. The steppe eagle and the marabou are opportunists and Aquilia colony can provide a lot of easy meals. The marabou is not well equipped for balancing on a thorn bush, but its long bill can reach a large number of nests. Chicks in nests built on the outside of bushes don't have much of a chance. The steppe eagle is a migrant from Europe, a relative of the golden eagle. Equally out of place on the top of a thorn tree, but lacking the jabbing bill of the marabou, the eagle can only hope to steal. The quelia can't do anything while the stalks are there. Nests are being destroyed and chicks consumed at an alarming rate. But the survivors must be fed even though there's devastation all around.
the surviving chicks are now eight days old and it's the eagles turn to take their toll. The chicks fill the nests now and it's easier for the eagle to get at them. As danger approaches, the chicks fall silent. The weave of the nest is not enough to save the chicks. Ironically though, it's strong enough to support the weight of an eagle. When an eagle gets right into the bush, he stays for a long time, and the parent quelia are too frightened to feed their young. It's a terrible dilemma, but the rising crescendo of begging calls eventually overcomes the parent's fear of the eagle. Before long, a few quelia are feeding their chicks within inches of the enemy. Once some begin feeding again, the rest soon follow. There are some survivors in the damaged nests and there is a distinct advantage in being the only survivor, a surfeit of food. Ten days after hatching, just 22 days since the first knot was tied, and chicks begin to venture from the nest. They can't fly yet, and the eagles are waiting in ever-increasing numbers. As more and more quelia chicks leave the nests, more and more birds of prey fly in to threaten the survival of the colony. Each chick struggles to the top of the nest and shrieks for food. This perch is now the center of his world. Each time the adults return with food, more chicks are drawn out of the nests. But they don't forget the youngest chicks. On this first day, any chick that strays from the nest platform becomes bewildered and must find his way back.
Every time another eagle arrives, the adult quelia scatter nervously. This is the most dangerous time for the chicks. Out of the nests, but unable to fly, their only hope is to remain deep in the thorn bush. The first attempts at flight are watched with great interest. Any chick that can frighten out of the bush becomes easy prey for the eagles. The eagles quickly discover that only a few chicks can be flushed from each bush, so they launch frequent surprise attacks on successive bushes. They can't catch the adult quelia who carry on feeding the chicks as opportunity permits. The next day, the fledglings no longer wait to be fed at the nest platforms, but scramble towards the parents as soon as they alight in the bush. This tactic rapidly degenerates into a frantic chase from branch to branch as begging broods harass the parents relentlessly until their crops are empty. The adults are bringing in something like six tons of grass seed a day to the hyperactive colony. And all this seed is gathered some distance away. The stock closest to the colony is left untouched. Instinctively, the birds know that this seed must be saved for a very special need that will arise later on. Despite the apparent chaos, the adults know and will feed only their own brood. Recognition is probably by call. Although fledglings beg from any adult, nothing will persuade the parents to feed any but their own chicks. This female, with only one of her brood surviving, is quite indifferent to the frantic begging of the other chicks. The overworked mother tries to take a rest, but the insistent begging from every direction never stops. In the late afternoon, the adults fly to the nearest water to drink and are harassed by yet more predators. After drinking, they return to the feeding grounds, this time to fill their crops for the night ahead. Satisfied at last, the chicks are drowsy as night approaches. The male quelia roost on their own, away from the colony, and may be joined by many thousands of non-breeding quelia, as well as birds that have lost their young. If they can, the chicks retreat to the sanctuary of their nests, where they're joined by the females.
the next crisis is the sudden arrival of marabou storks in ever greater numbers. Gangs of marauding storks begin surrounding isolated bushes. This change in tactics coincides with the fledglings' first attempts at flight. Catching the more mobile fledglings now requires somewhat greater effort. The increased activity attracts more and more storks to each bush in turn. Many fledglings react to the new tactics by trying to fly away. They don't stand a chance. As soon as the easy prey in one bush is finished, the marabou gang moves on to the next, systematically flushing young birds from all the isolated bushes. They move on to the heart of the colony, now threatening the birds in the thickest bushes. Even the gentle white stork joins in the carnage. At dawn, the survivors of yesterday's onslaught are blissfully unaware of the traumatic event they must face today. The last stage in the sequence of critical events upon which the success of the breeding colony depends has arrived. Once again, the quelia are in perfect synchrony with their habitat. The grass seeds around the colony have all ripened and dropped to the ground. This time, there's no response to the begging call. The adults are congregating quietly in groups and are not feeding their young. When hunger finally drives the juveniles out of the bush, they're led down towards the vast store of dried seed below and given one last feed from the parents' crop. Remarkably, family groups are still intact. The adults will soon leave their young and fly off in search of the right conditions in which to start the breeding cycle all over again. Now the parent strategy of leaving a rich food source untouched close to the colony becomes apparent. Literally starving, the juveniles find the seed and rapidly learn to feed themselves. They can fly much better now and are no longer such easy prey. first light, 32 days after construction of the first nest began, all the birds leave the colony. Their numbers more than doubled while they were there. Despite the efforts of predators, some four to five million birds have survived. The adults will fly far away, but the juveniles will establish roosts nearby 
and will stay in the area until they are forced to find new feeding grounds. The bushes are silent. The quelia, the marabou and the eagles have left just as suddenly as they arrived. The sturdy little nests have served their purpose and will soon disintegrate. For a while, however, they still bear witness to the events of the past few weeks. Flocks of feeding juveniles roll across the plains in search of food. The rolling motion develops as the leaders settle and are overflown by the birds behind, who then become leaders of the next wave. Although this procedure allows each bird only a short time to feed, the random movement must surely confuse any predators that are attracted by so conspicuous an activity. Numerous water holes are the focal points of life across the plains. Most animals come just to drink and don't linger. Some tarry for no apparent reason, while others pass the time by playing with dry baboon droppings. There are marabous at the water hole too, though they're not drinking. Small flocks of quelia suddenly fly in. They're extremely nervous, but desperate to drink. Only a few of the first flock manage to reach the water's edge before some of them catch sight of a lana falcon approaching from afar at over 100 kilometers an hour.
the flock's instantaneous reaction foils the attack. The falcon's tactics are to separate a bird from the flock. If the birds can reach the bushes in time, the predators will be frustrated. The marabous are still waiting. A large flock of quelia arrives from across the plains and funnels straight into the water hole. Without using the bushes, they begin to drink on the wing. Drinking like this is risky, and the marabous know what will happen. The attacks of the hawks will cause many birds to crash into the water. The number of waterlogged quelia falling easy prey to the marabous and eagles hardly diminishes the size of the onward moving flocks. The birds will not stay long at the water hole before the need for food drives them on, but no matter where they go, they will always be pursued. The erratic rainfall pattern of these semi arid regions determines the direction taken by the various flocks as they leave the breeding area. Sometimes they all go the same way, often they take different routes. Though unnoticed by people in their natural habitat, the quelia may now attract attention as a pest. Any ripening cereal crops lying in their path offer an irresistible food supply. Wheat, sorghum, millet and rice are all likely to be eaten. To the farmer, a large flock of quelia approaching his fields is a dreadful sight. It can mean total loss of his crops. But although the quelia may spell disaster for the individual farmer, it's now known that national losses rarely exceed 1% of total production. Other pests and diseases cause far greater damage, but they attract less attention because they're less visible. It's much easier to vent your anger on a flock of birds than at a fungus or a green fly. These flocks, in fact, are not quelia at all, they're chestnut weavers. But the farmer always blames the quelia. However, whether it's chestnut weavers or quelia eating the crop, something has to be done. In the croplands, the birds often roost in the tall trees around farm villages. The firebomb is one way of getting at them. While a government quelia control unit prepares the charges, local farmhands watch nonchalantly. They've seen it all before. 
Quelia have often roosted at this site in past years. The first birds fly in as preparations continue. Five kilos of gelignite are placed under a drum containing 150 liters of mixed petrol and diesel. Instantaneous fuses link a series of charges. It's a specialist's job, placing the explosives so that the burning fuel is blasted to just the right height. The birds must be destroyed, but without damaging the village. By seven o'clock, all the birds have arrived. One hundred thousand birds died, well over ninety percent of the roost. Poisonous sprays are another way of destroying large roosts. This is a more hazardous method both for the pilot and in terms of its effect on the environment it's impossible to apply the poison with absolute precision. Obstructions may hinder the flight path or wind currents may simply blow the chemicals off the target area. Any poison capable of killing quelia will kill other animals as well some of which are bound to be beneficial to man. The use of poison can have irreversible effects which in the long run may be far worse than the damage done by the quelia. The risk is justified only when they're causing severe crop losses. In their natural habitat, the quelia can be left alone. There they face population controls that are far more severe than any that man could impose. Quelia numbers are always in balance with the prevailing conditions of their semi-arid environment. And the balance is very sensitive. Even the seasonal variations in food supply kill more birds each year than any control operation does. Overall, the quelia population seems remarkably stable. Experts say there are more birds around today than there were 40 years ago when control operations began. Periodically, successive years of plenty produce a population explosion among the quelia. But even this is no cause for long-term alarm. It is inevitable that the population will crash in the first bad year. Only a minute fraction of the quelia population ever invades the croplands and it is only in the croplands that efforts to combat the birds make any sense at all. It is simply not possible to reduce quelia numbers throughout their vast range, for no matter how many are killed, the bird's natural resilience will always ensure that its population size stands close to the maximum number that the environment can support. The quelia is a very good example of a creature that has evolved to survive in a difficult environment. Its mastery of the grasslands puts into perspective the efforts of humans to control one of the great tides of nature.
Well, next Monday at 5 o'clock, we witness the conflict between the various animals who jostle for a drink at the Atosha National Park in Namibia. The Greatest Show in Africa opens Wednesday at 9 on 4.